the Migration Summit. I'm really excited to have everyone here today and to introduce again another amazing, amazing session. The Migration Summit 2023, organized by MIT React, NAML, Karam Foundation, is a month long global convening designed to build bridges between diverse communities of displaced learners, universities, companies, social enterprises, policymakers, employees, and governments around key challenges and opportunities for refugee and migrant communities. This year, we're exploring the theme for creating pathways for learning, livelihoods, and dignity. And if you could give me one 30 seconds. So this song, someone asked about this song, it was written by someone from our, from our organization committee who has this, has this methodology of taking stories and making song of it. So this, is, this, this was from one of our refugee alumni, and Patricia, a refugee, a Congolese refugee in South Africa. And she told her story to Marike and Marike made a song with a story. So it's a really special, special song for us and music to the opening of all of our sessions of the summit. So after that, I'm happy to hand over, hand over to Alice, the Senior Partnership and Content Officer for Their World. Welcome Alice and welcome everyone else. Welcome everyone and thank you so much Lorraine for that lovely introduction. We're so excited to be here and I'm going to be introducing and hosting this session but also introducing the panel. So today in this panel we're going to be discussing approaches to delivering equitable education by, with and for child refugees. This is one of the sector's greatest challenges. With every second children are excluded from high quality education, their wasted potential accumulates. It's an urgent problem that we all need to collaborate to fix. We're going to start this session by introducing three approaches that the panelists have taken in their roles to address this challenge. We will then create space for anyone interested in emergency education to come together and workshop some of the opportunities and challenges around emergency children's education. We're then going to end the session with a co-created guide to refugee education innovation, which all attendees can use, share, and contribute to. This, this session will be up to 90 minutes long, meaning we'll finish around 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 18 hours Central European Standard Time, and 17 hours British summer time. So, and now I'm very excited to introduce you to our incredible panelists of speakers. Um, the firstly, I'm going to go with my colleague, Angela. Angela is the Senior Advisor for Innovation Projects and Research at Their World, a global children's charity. As part of her role, she leads the Education Innovation Scale-Up Awards, an accelerator and grant program for nonprofits, and um, Angela is also herself a social entrepreneur and currently runs a communications and strategy studio for purpose-driven organizations. She's a former British diplomat and a mother to two, as she always says, future feminist boys. Next up, we have Gideon Oluwaranju, who is the founder and chief executive director of Area I, a community-led education organization supporting displaced learners in northern Nigeria. He's also a former Their World Global Youth Ambassador, and Area I was a recipient of one of Their World's first five Education Innovation Awards. Today, he's going to lead the discussions on the theme, Reinventing the Wheel, But Better. This is about how he and others have combined existing tools and approaches and adapted them to new scenarios to reach learners with education. We're also joined today by Juliette Bonaparte, who is a researcher and advocacy specialist for Opora, a Netherlands-based research organization focused on social justice. Juliette's work specializes in migration, refugee, international law, and international relations. She's also here today with her colleague, Veronika Skorobogatko, a Ukrainian based in the Netherlands. She specializes in migration and identity topics, communications, and international relations. She works with Opora as a researcher and since 2022 is mainly been focusing on projects around Ukrainians abroad, Ukrainian community, and identity. They're also here with their colleague Oksana Savchuk, who is the coordinator at Ukrainian House in Rotterdam in the Netherlands and leads a platform for Ukrainian arts and culture within which she created an architectural school for Ukrainian teachers. So the three of them are going to lead a discussion today on the theme of step aside. That is how we can create space for young people to plug the gaps in their emergency education and have the actual tools to innovate themselves. 
So after that incredible list of panelists, who I'm sure you're all very excited to hear from today, I'm thrilled to be handing it over to our first panelist, Gideon, who is going to speak about reinventing the wheel, but better. Thank you, Gideon. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fantastic. So good afternoon once again, everyone. My name is Gideon Olanri Waju, and I'm the Chief Executive Director of Aid for Rural Education Access Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization that works to provide access to quality uh, programmatic interventions for children in rural communities and displaced um, areas in northern Nigeria. Uh, through our work at Area High, we have a solid understanding that ensuring access to foundational skills development, particularly within non-formal learning environment, or for children or refugees, requires an integrated approach with different overlapping advantages. And this usually involves combining asymmetrical tactics or unconventional means and methods. I believe this is one of the vital components of our impact strategy that has culminated in our reach over the last few years. But what got us to this point? It is because we felt while hundreds of other humanitarian and civil society actors are doing something somewhere to improve the quality of educational provision or, le or learning delivery to thousands of refugees across communities and camps, we ask ourselves, have these interventions delivered results for these beneficiaries? Or better still, are refugee children really learning? If the answer is yes, what can we do to improve? And if the answer is no, what can we do differently? I believe our programmatic response is what buttresses the central question of how do we combine or we combine interventions or responses to bring top tech and basic learning to those that are most in need. And that was what gave birth to our program called Fast Track. So data from the World Bank implies that nine out of 10 children in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, in Nigeria, cannot read or write or do basic arithmetic at the age of 10. But evidence from the 2017 Education Data Survey also revealed that of the 22 million children in primary one to primary three in public schools across Nigeria, 50% of them cannot do basic arithmetic at the age of 10. However, the most that is affected by this national learning crisis are those children that are displaced in several insurgent attacked communities that have suffered from the Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria, scattered across many refugee camps in northern Nigeria. Many of them are missing from formal education and cannot even actually. It is in response to this that we develop something called fast track. So, what is fast track? Fast Track is an accelerated foundational skills development program that combines proving of functional literacy and numeracy skills that is necessary for further education or employment. So the question is, what is innovative about our solution or what is different in our approach? Or better still, how are we reinventing the wheel but doing it better? The innovativeness of Fast Track lies in the combination of three evidence-based teaching and learning approaches, evidence-based interventions or methodologies that exist before we came into the space. The first is the world-renowned teaching at the right level methodology that allows us to group these refugee children into learning clusters based on their learning capabilities. The second is the bilingual model of language instruction, which is premised on the fact that children are able to learn a new language when they are taught in a language that they are born with or familiar with. And lastly, is a self-assisted technology-enabled instruction, which is facilitated through the use of an online pen that has audio capabilities and translate materials from English into any of Nigeria's three most spoken languages. This will be the base of what I will be explaining later in our session on how we are reinventing the wheel to ensure foundational skills learning gets to the most marginalized refugee children in Northern Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gideon. That was absolutely fascinating. And now I'm excited to hand it over to my colleague, Angela, who is going to talk about Share, Share, Share. Thank you, Alice. I'm so inspiring, Gideon, to hear you speak. And I'm really excited as well to hear from our other uh, friends and partners in later in the session. Um, so excited to be here. But 
I'm going to start on a really depressing note, <laughs> which is uncharacteristic for me, I promise. Um, 600 million children, 600 million children are not getting enough basic education in literacy and maths. And when I think about that number, I just feel completely overwhelmed. Maybe you do too. I, I imagine we have lots of education practitioners here and it sometimes seems like the challenge is enormous. Well, it is. Um, and uh, for as much as it feels impossible to solve a challenge like that, I think we're all aware that we have to break it down into chunks that are a bit more manageable. And um, at Their World, we're working on three different levels to chunk out this problem and have an impact. One, um, I'm gonna briefly just outline those and then we're gonna talk a bit more about um, the innovation uh, education support that we provide and how that works and I wanna get your, your feedback on it. So the three levels to chunk out this massive problem, one is around campaigning and advocacy. So Their World, works to put in place or to have to lobby others to put in place the policy frameworks and financing that makes education accessible. So on a macro level, um, we were one of the organizations who put education on the agenda for humanitarian responses back in 2011. Now it's completely taken as given that education is part of an emergency response. And that's a huge achievement that has been achieved through campaigning. Um, now, our current priority is around access to early years education. Um, we've identified that there is a global early years crisis and that despite the fact that this is the period where the child's brain develops the most and so the return on investment in education and development is the greatest, yet only 1% of global GDP is spent on early years um, and early child development. And that's especially devastating for communities on the move, children who have had um, a disadvantaged start in life. But the outcome of investment is really, really high. Um, so if you uh, feel moved by that, then we'd love to encourage you to visit our Act for Early Years campaign and sign up to our open letter, which calls on G20 leaders to commit to at least 10% of early of education budgets going on early years. And you'll be hearing a lot more from us about that as the campaign develops, but we'd love to have your support. So that's one way to have an impact is on the macro level by campaigning and changing the policy and financing frameworks. Um, secondly, raising the voices of young people uh, who are the biggest stakeholders in education um, to um, hear what they need and want and expect from their education and through uh, their world's global youth ambassador program that Gideon participated in, um, we are helping to um, provide you young people with the skills and the platform to raise their voices and make their demands. Um, applications are open at the moment, so if that's of interest, um, we'll put the link in the chat. And then thirdly, and this is the bit that I work on, it's around supporting innovative and sustainable solutions to education problems that are community led and that happen through our portfolio of grants and projects with implementers in Africa, the Middle East, Asia and Europe. And um, my experience of working on these programs is that for sure one thing we need to solve that epic education crisis is innovation. That is new ways of thinking about and approaching education um, that can really change um, systems and make education more accessible and affordable. Um, and I wanted to start out by saying that innovation isn't like a stroke of genius, like a light bulb or a, a flash of lightning. It is the process. It's a series of steps that you have to take to go from having a great idea to having something that works. Um, so in the, um, in the sort of, what is it, about three years that we've been actively um, an innovation actor, but also in our 20 year experience as a supporter of innovative community led education projects, their world and my team have been seeing more and more resources online and toolkits and support for education innovators to grow and um, make their nonprofit ideas into successful scaled up um, systems changing in, uh, initiatives. But we also know from research by UNICEF and others that there are still way too many barriers that education innovations face. And three of the biggest barriers are funding. Well, 
we all face <laughs> barriers around funding, I'm sure, in many of our projects. Funding for scale-up, though, which is different from funding for a project. Scale-up means you need to think about growing your team and investing in partnerships and networks and exploring new countries. It's a different set of activities that you need to do than what you need to do to deliver a program. Um, secondly, skills. So when you're growing in innovation, you need a different skill set than when you're just starting out. And um, building those skills doesn't come naturally to everyone. It's a very different, um, it's a very different thing to do. Um, and then thirdly, evidence. And I know we're all very conscious of the need to have robust evidence that shows the impact of our interventions and our efforts, but not always are there budgets and skill sets available to collect that evidence, especially um, on smaller projects where that are just starting out. So we try to address those three key challenges, funding, skills, and evidence. Um, so that great pilots and great, you know, game-changing education innovations don't bolter too early in their life cycle, but they have the chance to have the impact that their founders desire and dream of. So in trying to fill that gap, we're part of a global community, and this is where we come to the part about sharing, share, 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 which is the topic of our discussion um, on this topic today. So our our approach to filling the gap is that we have created the Their World Education Innovation Scale-Up Awards, which is a grant and a masterclass and a mentoring program for promising education nonprofits to scale up. So they got a lot of support from us. Um, we fill a very special niche with that because we focus completely on nonprofits. And this year, 100% of our finalists are community-led organizations. Uh, that means they're staffed and led by the people who live in or, uh, and are from the country where the intervention takes place. And so far, we've graduated our first cohort, which Area I was a member of. We had five winners and dispersed £250,000 in grants to those winners. They had nine months of masterclasses and support, and we impacted five big education challenges through that cohort. One was around um, uh, the challenge that Gideon addresses, where you have children at all different stages of their learning in an, in an IDP camp, and how do you create an intervention that works for them? Um, one is around uh, creating native language, local language storybooks for children to develop their literacy and a love of reading, which was tackled by NABU, um, an international um, uh, children's literacy organization. Um, Ubongo is one of, was one of the winners of the first um, cohort, and they, they make educational cartoons that go out on TV and on the internet. But what if you don't have a phone or a television in your home? Well, we help them develop the partnerships on the ground that they would need to bring their game-changing education content to learners in Uganda that didn't have access to those tools. Um, in Lebanon, we supported Lebanese Alternative Learning, a um, tech-driven nonprofit. To, um, to bring support tools to teachers who were working online but in remote areas through WhatsApp and other tools. And in Uganda, we supported, again in Uganda, we supported children on the edge with their innovative cluster learning approach that really goes deep into supporting caregivers and community members to buy into and support the early years education of their children. So massive impact, over 2 million learners reached, and that was fantastic. And we're just now selecting our second cohort, which will have three winners and disperse, we think, up to £240,000 in grants with a program that builds on the learning from our first, from our first version. Um, and if you would like more information, uh, Chanel and anyone else who's listening, we are going to share all the links here in the chat. I think that Alice has actually already just shared them. Um, the programme is called the Education Innovation Scale-Up Awards. And we'd encourage you to join our newsletter because another cohort will be announced later this year. Um, so applications are closed for cohort two, but cohort three is coming soon. Um, so what does this have to do with share, share, share? Well, in two minutes, I will tell you um, three things. One, um, we decided to take a very sharing oriented approach to this program. So we deliver it through um, partners and experts in scale up, uh, particularly for humanitarian and nonprofit innovations. But we don't want to keep all of that uh, skill set and um, those resources to ourselves. We want to share it. So in the first cohort, all of our top 20 finalists got access to the resources, even if they didn't win the, the pr final prize. And the second time around, we times that by 100. <laughs> uh, actually, no, we times it by 10. We had 200 organizations um, joining two free masterclasses on um, scale readiness. 
um, which is brilliant because it was completely open access. So we are really pro sharing and bringing a spirit of generosity and openness to our work in this area. Secondly, we want to share, share, share through building networks of community education innovators to support each other. And this is where I hope you will join me in a breakout room later to brainstorm how that could work. Um, we found organic connections happening between members of our community, which is fantastic. But we also, when we asked participants for feedback, everyone said, we want an alumni network, we want a community of practice. But you probably know from your own experience and definitely our research supports this, that some networks work better than others. So what would be the factors for success and how could we create a really constructive and uh, active network of education innovators supporting each other? And thirdly, uh, drawing inspiration from Gideon's work of reinventing the wheel, but better, we have tried to share, share, share the insight and learning that others have already had in this field. So we've connected with um, other organizations that support education innovation, like the Humanitarian Education Accelerator run by UN agencies. We spoke with private sector accelerators and network organizations like 100, Nesta and INEE. And we're really open to hearing the successes and failures of others and sharing ours with an open heart. So my pitch to you in this session is, um, if you uh, decide to join the breakout session that we'll talk about share, 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 I'd love to explore your experiences on networks, what organizations you've engaged with that may be adding value to the growth of innovations in education or other fields, and how best to find and work with more community-based organizations, because the scale of the challenge is enormous, but it's um, fantastic to be able to take one part of it and try and have a meaningful impact. So thank you very much for having me and thanks for listening and hopefully see some people in the breakout session shortly. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Angela. That was great. And I know if anyone's interested, as Angela said, I've put all the links in the chat. And now I'm very excited to introduce, hand it over to our final three panelists, Juliet, Rana and Oksana to talk about Step Aside. Hi guys, nice, nice to have you all in here. Thanks for sharing the afternoon with us and I hope it will be insightful, exciting, yet productive for all of us because indeed, as Angela was mentioning, it's about sharing, sharing, sharing all of it, experiences, knowledge, uh, ideas, innovation, whatever, because yeah, we live in such a connected world. So let's make it work, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, here we are Juliette and Veronica from Opora Foundation and we also have online our colleague and uh, partner, friend basically, uh, Oksana, uh, who is leading the Ukrainian um, uh, house in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. She will share her experience of the recent projects that they were running uh, um, in a bit. Um, meanwhile, we want to just set up a bit the scene and we will be sharing a short presentation and take you through some uh, steps that we've already been through and then Oksana will join with uh, her experience in Rotterdam specifically. Just give us a second to connect the presentation. And I think it's worth to say on the meantime uh, a little bit more about who, or, uh, who we are. Um, and we are going to zoom in a little bit because we are not necessarily uh, specialized uh, in, in education, but we are specialized in research. And so we did quite a lot of research on education um, and specifically on the access to education for displaced Ukrainian children in the Netherlands. Um, and this is specifically important for us because, well, we are based in the Netherlands and although space Ukrainians have a very special status, of course, and they have uh, already quite a lot of access to education, um, the, like, let's say the education objectives are not yet completely achieved. And that's what we found uh, in our, in our research. Um, and so we will well, talk about <laughs> <some> more about <laughs> some of our we're, we're going to dive in a little bit on some of our findings that help explain a little bit more about yeah, what Opora's work has been uh, focused on and why we're also still focused on space Ukrainians when talking about access to education. And then one, why we want to lead you in a conversation to think of how to step aside um, and how to specifically fill the gaps. Because although they might have access to schools, um, or to general education, what we found in our reports um, is that, well, the 
education that they have um, or, or also in terms of the well-being that they uh, feel is not necessarily um, uh, providing them a, a safe environment or a, a good environment for them to be able to learn. Um, and hopefully we can go through this a bit more. Should we should we stop the presentation and just uh... yeah well we already stopped <laughs> we're just trying to access sorry guys was all no set up. do, do you and, have a, um, a drive or something I'm happy to to share it for you if you want to send uh, it and it's it's our system drive so I think it will be a bit difficult to to do that but let me let me just do one other thing maybe it will help out uh, let's just. Let's just keep the presentation here for us. Yeah, maybe we will not show yet. <laughs> as soon as it's up, we will just present ourselves uh, just talking through. So visuals, it's us for the moment, guys. Uh, just to buy for that. So basically, what Juliette was saying about the research field that we are in, it actually started uh, last year um, in February, March, as a response, immediate response, obviously, to the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And when people started moving, fleeing Ukraine, etc. Uh, later on, during 2022, it was organized into the research-based um, NGO uh, to focus basically on the gap, to bridge the gap between the policymakers and display, displaced people. So far, uh, in the Netherlands at least, where we're based, we have around 100,000 um, Ukrainian refugees at the moment. And I think it's growing, it's predicted to grow. And around 30 or 35 percent of those are children. So, yeah, they need some access to education, to proper life as, as much as possible at this moment. Um, and that's what we are also trying to navigate through, to learn about with our core team plus uh, representatives and coordinators uh, in the whole Netherlands, to be honest, uh, for some of you, it might be seem a small country, but uh, with 100,000 people coming, that's quite an effort to, to look into that and how the reality is. Um, therefore, we made a group of, uh, and still searching, collaborating with uh, quite a number of professionals and trying to do policy-informed research to also help local um, and uh, national government to address the issues where they arise and be the partner um, in, the, in this instance. And so far, last year, there were a few uh, steps done, um, research for uh, general assessment and specifically on education, which Juliet can share some uh, information about because this is setting up the scene for other projects that we are running. Yeah, and I would say on a side note, uh, although we are also doing research, we're still providing services for Ukrainians uh, um, by providing uh, legal advice and also uh, preparing a mental health program. Um, yeah, that's a side note. But yeah, towards our research insights um, and why I'm going to talk about this. Um, so we found that basically many cases of, um, th there's many cases of aggressive behavior between the teenagers, especially since now it's been a year after the war. And although they may have access to education, um, we found that there is actually the levels of satisfaction of the educational system uh, is quite low or quite average um, for Ukrainian children. And the correlations that we found between when we asked them um, in our qualitative interviews of why they were maybe unsatisfied were related to um, issues regarding to numbers of Dutch hours, but also whether or not they were integrated with Dutch um, peers. Um, and so what we found is that actually many of the children responded very positively to being integrated and having high levels of socialization with other Dutch children. And the reason why this is quite important to know um, is that we also saw that actually a wide majority of them did not have access to extracurricular activities. And um, what we want to really sort of push is that when um, children in migration are living in uh, shelters and going to school, um, a lot of like extracurricular activities and social activities can really help them um, with their access to education and by providing good learning uh, environments for them and a better well-being in general. Um, and so it, taking into consideration that 
way big, like a, a very big majority of them are staying in shelters. Um, it is actually uh, quite a tough situation to be in. And there's also lack of privacy issues, which means that all of these elements should be taken into consideration when think of, thinking of um, providing education. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And then looking more closely into this educational part, uh, we teamed up, uh, thanks Angela and the team, early this year to do another more insightful um, research report specifically on resilience and ingenuity of uh, Ukrainian youth, Ukrainian children. Um, so we focused on the experiences uh, of emergency education uh, for Ukrainian children who are staying in Ukraine itself at the moment or for the entire year actually so far, those who fled to the Netherlands and uh, to the UK. Um, we're not going to deep dive in everything, but I think some insightful information came up uh, even for us, which we didn't hypothesize <laughs> in the very beginning, except for the idea that you can see that both parents, children, and teachers, uh, students, they, they do show the resilience throughout their educational process, no matter in what, in what form it's taking uh, place. And um, to be honest, what, what is uh, still the case is for middle and high school students, they do combine uh, two systems of education. If they fled to, for example, the Netherlands or the UK, they continue with Ukrainian school online um, and go to those uh, local classes, uh, whatever it is, either it's a language or math or something extra independent really locally what's what's available uh, in that region. Uh, in this instance, really the digital uh, projects and initiatives done by the students themselves, especially in the university, plus in Ukraine, some NGOs or schools teachers, they've created special platforms to actually empower and facilitate the education, keep that continuity, uh, because um, I would say, yeah, from findings, plus from our experience that Ukrainian mentality is that education is very important and nobody wants to miss out on that. So people try to accommodate, to adjust, um, as Angela mentioned, for example, in their project, the same in Ukraine, there are WhatsApp groups or any Telegram groups or other chats that teachers, directors of schools uh, do use to connect to their students, no matter where they are, or even given lessons from abroad to those who stayed in Ukraine and combining a different skill set over there. Uh, what's uh, kind of a backup from the previous research is that hobbies and sports are, well, any extra curriculum activities are pretty important in the stressful situation for kids plus uh, parents as well, because it gives some kind of a structure and it provides a relief or a therapy uh, for children themselves, even even if they don't recognize it right away in the long term, uh, it's a supporting system for them. Um, on the other hand, uh, youth and teenagers, students of the higher uh, educational institutions do take uh, active part in creating those either projects or uh, initiatives uh, to support each other and support people back home in Ukraine, um, basically creating their own um, yeah, sorry, I'm repeating myself, creating those projects, for example, um, fundraising and then sending money back home or helping others to enter university abroad if this is on the agenda for those. And that, well, that Ukrainian youth uh, basically learning skills and acquiring knowledge from different perspectives. So it's not the specific curriculum that you have at school, you have at the university, is uh, taking upon more uh, tasks and uh, becoming mature, uh, maybe faster, maybe expected for them, uh, but they, take, they do take charge. Uh, and therefore, what we see in our research with that um, small groups in the Netherlands and the UK and Ukraine that uh, Ukrainian teenagers should be involved and included in as many projects as possible because it helps them, it help them to acquire that uh, knowledge to broaden their skills and be creative, find the solutions for themselves and uh, mm -hmm. in cooperation with others and basically... Uh, either take the tools or create their own tools to, to deal with the situation. And while as one of those examples is actually the work that Oksana and her team has been doing in Rotterdam. Uh, it's a 
uh, well, second biggest city in the Netherlands. And uh, Oksana, maybe you can share more how many people you have there, uh, well, Ukrainian community itself, how it might have grown for the past year. Uh, but the projects that the Ukrainian house that was created also with the newcomers, I believe, uh, in Rotterdam, um, they were uh, projects uh, to give more freedom to teenagers themselves, um, uh, creating their own parties, their own collaboration space, as well as a special workshop program um, about, uh, with the help of art, uh, through architecture and urban uh, design for teenagers of 12 and 18 years old to well, help the creativity grow and uh, get them involved uh, into the learning process through this way. Sana, I will give word to you. Meanwhile, I'll try to set up the visual part that we prepared for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, I am probably should tell a few words about Ukrainian House. It's actually initiative of municipality of Rotterdam. Uh, it was open in the beginning of March, so pretty fast uh, reaction and response. And I was here as a volunteer the first weeks, and I'm really proud and happy to be able to do this as my job for the whole year already, and a bit more. So we indeed ran on the, on the power of about 50 volunteers. 90% uh, of them are people who fled from Ukraine themselves, um, as we noticed from the beginning that, yeah, people who arrive here, they can understand better those people who also arrive here um, and they can comfort and support each other in, in ways that local people um, not really able to do. So, um, yeah, we provide here uh, opportunities just based on what people want to do themselves. So anyone from the community just comes to me and say, hey, I have this idea, how can we do it? And my job is to figure out how can we do it and how to involve other people from the community to make it happen. Uh, so, yeah, about the architecture school, as I see the slide is out. Um, Actually, based on, uh, on the research of Opora Foundation, we noticed that uh, teenagers is a very interesting group who has the most difficulty with psychological adaptation to the situation. So this idea came from a combination with an open call from the stimulating fund, the creative funds of, uh, industry in, in the Netherlands, and uh, the combination of that uh, report on a problematic uh, uh, group, uh, the one who struggles a lot even in the normal world. Um, so we came up with this idea of um, architecture and urbanism school um, as a place where children, teenagers can reflect on the topic of home. So something which is very difficult to talk about, but once you left home, you, you were forced to do it. And we decided to use that team to turn it around. So the place where children can process the team of home, but with new perspectives and with creative output. So um, for about two months, there were uh, regular full Saturday meetings with occasional excursions and some uh, guided tours uh, where children uh, were uh, guided by four um, tutors who actually also fled Ukraine himself from Kharkiv School of Architecture. Um, and through that process, they could like um, unpeel the concept of home and relate it to, um, to the new context. So sort of learning to adapt, but in this abstract way, it was super interesting for children from the feedback, which we just had a final presentation on Saturday and the feedback from children was fantastic. Uh, they, uh, one of them told that, um, through this project, they learned that home is not a physical place uh, and home is the place you make yourself. So sort of this was the goal to teach the children um, this active stand, active position on sort of making them learn that actually they don't have to be the victims of history, they can create the new history. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also 
um, applies to other activities which we do, specifically in Ukrainian house. We do have, uh, for example, uh, the biggest, most engaging project is the party project. Uh, it was asked by teenagers um, from 16 till 18 years old. They came here with a problem. Uh, they live in a shelter with parents, sometimes with multiple generation of parents and uh, smaller children. Uh, they don't have any privacy. Uh, they can't sort of have their own room and they um, want to hang with their friends. So um, we just told them that they could do whatever they want and we will figure out how to support that. They told they want a wild party. So we bought a party lights. Uh, we organized a party committee who would be responsible for... Um, Organizing a PR campaign, uh, organizing safety at the location, organizing a mocktail bar, uh, organizing um, decoration of the space, uh, preparing, um, uh, yeah, the, the whole, uh, changing the atmosphere of something which during the daytime is information point, humanitarian aid point, into basically a nightclub from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. Uh, of course, there are always uh, about four to five um, volunteers who are above 18 um, present at the location just for safety and to keep an eye on what's happening. But uh, it, the feedback was fantastic. It was, um, uh, we do, we try to do it every month or every two months and the place uh, gives the space for teenagers to be themselves. Mm -hmm to let off the steam because we see that there is a lot of aggression, a lot of uh, not willingness to accept the situation and a lot of grief for their lost friends. So at, at these parties, what I see happening is like new friendships are made. Sometimes people were studying in one class, but at a class, the atmosphere is not super inviting to make, make friendships because the, the those places the most, the most critique I heard from them is that they only learn Dutch and nothing else, and they like hate it. So they try to go away from school as fast as possible and go home or go to their friends, but it's problematic if they don't have any friends yet. So many children made friends at these parties and sort of, now I can say it, it made long-term friendships as, as far as uh, we would do it for more than half a year. Um, so that is actually also like some sort of physical therapy, I believe, because they go wild dancing here and it, you really, really feel physical, the, this blowing of the steam. <laughs> I could go on forever, but I guess uh, that's going to be a short teaser <laughs> for those who want to know more. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Oksana. Thanks for sharing. I hope indeed uh, it made a bit of introduction for those of you who might not have known much uh, about Ukrainian uh, children or the way they're studying, experiencing different uh, educational processes. Um, and I hope we can actually talk about it more in the breakout session, maybe hear more of your ideas of what the experiences you had in your communities, your localities, et cetera, et cetera. Once again, to share that experience. And if someone of you is actually based in the Netherlands, you're really welcome to come over to help out, maybe be a volunteer for a couple of hours or a day. Uh, or just spread the word and uh, maybe you see something relevant in your own uh, either university or work environment that could be helpful. Uh, we'd appreciate that as well and then stay in contact and touch. Uh, but I hope we can still brainstorm today, at least for the time we have left, on uh, how such things as educational environment, which is non formal can be useful and can be facilitated to empower a uh, young generation, basically. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you. That was so interesting. And you teed up the um, breakout session so nicely. So now, and I'm sure everyone's kind of buzzing to get into the ones that they're interested, we're going to open up the three breakout rooms to discuss each of the three topics in more detail and hear from everyone who's present. So the way that we're going to do this instead of assigning you is that we'd like you to choose any of the breakout rooms and join the presenters there for discussion and brainstorm. And we'll come back in around 20 minutes and share our findings. So I think... 
If Camilla can open the breakout rooms, then you are all welcome to join as you'd like. Yeah, so I've already opened all. Uh, if someone has trouble joining, please let me know and I can assign you to whichever breakout. You'll see that it has its renamed with, with the topic. And so reinvent the wheel um, to join Gideon, then share, share, share to join Angela, and then step aside to join Juliet, Veronica, and Oksana. Uh, so see you in a bit. Hi, we're back, I guess. I think that's everyone back now. So I hope you all enjoyed your breakout rooms. We were so excited to see that there were some really fascinating and interesting conversations going on. And especially a big thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, if you want to go back to anything from the introductions and the panel session, um, a recording of today's session will be captioned and published on the Migration Summit YouTube channel. And we invite you to join and register for future sessions throughout the month. I'll pop a link into the chat. But thank you so much to everyone for attending today. Um, and if anyone has anything else to share, feel free to pop it in the chat. But thank you. Yeah, I, I would love to listen like more about the experience on the breakout. Like, how, how was it for everyone? Yeah, for us, it was very interesting. Uh, we had uh, um, some talks um, about uh, how how to provide, how to help with social cohesion uh, in migrant groups and then for children. Um, but also because it was interesting because everybody was from a different place in the world. So we were trying to also think about how we can uh, share from our experiences, although uh, the groups are different. Um, and I think there's still a lot to be shared and we didn't have enough time to really talk about everything that we wanted to, but, uh, but I think the two points that are already standing out uh, is that uh, the visibility of the programs that are happening for children specifically, for teenagers, for migrants is important within the group itself, but also outside of the migrant group and be building partnerships with the uh, different uh, types of organizations, different level of organizations, whether it's, for example, school maybe or an NGO or local uh, business even. And another thing I think what uh, Nicholas brought up it's about sharing the success stories um, of the migrant well children teenagers especially teenagers I think because it's the uh, different stage of life where people becoming yeah maybe more responsible for their own choices and they need to figure out next steps etc and that's also connected to the question okay when you're out of that either shelter camp or whatever it is depending on the situation what's next so I think, yeah, that's that's the take out so far. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, Angela. Thank you. Um, from the, the breakout group on share, share, share. Um, I mean, we did we did a lot of sharing in a very short time, <laughs> and some awesome uh, comments came in from from everybody. Um, we were talking about what makes a successful network and a network that can have impact. Um, and uh, I think so. We had um, different examples shared. One around the Association for the Future of Work, which works on a different topic, but which succeeds because it has a very clear purpose. Well, breakout groups within it have very clear purposes, so um, everyone has a clear objective and a timeline, like a reason to be there. Um, likewise, on uh, the idea of bringing people and teachers together through digital skills development communities, so where they are learning a skill together or maybe at the same stage in a journey, building a community of practice or, or a network around that could be a success factor. Um, we also heard about the Teachers for Rural Development initiative, which is bringing teachers together from different types of schools in rural Nigeria and helping share best practice between in both directions from those who work with international schools and those who work with rural and um, uh, private or public schools. Um, and also the example around um, creating advocacy groups who have a shared goal of holding policymakers to account. Um, for example, in South Florida, um, one of our, our breakout group members was involved with uh, holding the municipality to account for, for her local area's um, commitment to an achievement around the SDGs, including SDG4. So like everything was interesting and I would love to go into more detail on it all and hope we can all stay in touch. 
Thanks. Awesome, thank you. And uh, I'll let Charles speak, but also I'm going to be sharing on the chat, actually with the Migration Summit, we're trying to have this initiative of mapping the ecosystem. And so I'll be sending a form because we want, you know, everyone's organizations to be like filling out the form for us to be creating, you know, a document or for example, everyone working with child refugees. And so for everyone to have uh, connections and being able to collaborate, you know, from the summit already, we've heard a lot of, of organizations working uh, on that field. And so I think it would be very rich to see everyone collaborating further. Um, so I'll be sending the link now, but Charles, I'm happy to, to listen to your experience too. All right, great. Thank you very much, Hello, everyone. So I joined the Reinventing the Wheel breakout group session or group, and it was quite insightful. Gideon gave an extensive you know, explanation, sharing on the experience with every eye on how we can reinvent the wheel, right? And three, he highlighted three main critical points that I think I, I think I would like to share with us. And the first one would be uh, leveraging evidence generation and adoption, right? For us to be able to reinvent the way for millions of children and promote access to equitable education for these children, we have to be able to leverage evidence and actually adopt evidence, right? The second thing I mentioned is uh, the power of documenting and reporting what works, right? I mean, across development, uh, you know, the international development space, but in the field of education, development rights, there, we, there are no so much evidence of what works, right? So if we have to reinvent the wheel, we have to ensure that we are putting our money into the good uh, interventions that are promoting sustainable outcomes, right? And the third thing you mentioned is the part of leveraging low-cost and zero-tech programming, right? How can we adopt innovative and low-cost technology to scale innovative solutions that can enable us to reinvent education, right? So this is a great point that, you know, that, you know, feature in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And so I think, you know, I had a lot of fun listening, listening to it. I think it was, the session was so rich and I was mentioning Alice, just, you know, the projects are so different between each other. And so I'm glad to, to see people, you know, being able to, to choose in which topic they want to contribute. And so, yeah, I'll leave it to, to any, to the panelists, moderators, in case you want to say some last words and looking forward to seeing you in other sessions. Thank you so much. Nothing else to, from, to add for me. Thank you all for being here. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you for yeah. joining. And thank you, Angela, for also uh, the, the migration side. <laughs>